When I was younger, I was a nerd who knew a lot about sex. I mean, growing up, we had the Kama Sutra on the walls as decoration. It was the 70s, and of course, I read every Judy Bloom book I could get my hands on. Judy taught me a lot. I mean, like, definitely more than the gym teacher in charge of sex ed ever could have. Actually, I'm sure for most of us, it was Judy Bloom, which is why she's one of the most banned authors in the country. Sweet, sweet, smutty Judy Bloom. Banning authors and books is not new, but it's one of those few retro things that you really want to keep in the past, like a jello salad. That is not salad. Because when politicians start banning books in the name of protecting children, you know things are going to get really bad. Protecting children from what? Learning about racism? Learning about their bodies? Learning about families with two moms? <sighs> I save some of my most choice words for people like Ron DeSantis. Politicians who don't want to just dismantle our public education, but want to gut our public libraries because they're afraid of knowledge. Like, not for themselves. I mean, they have lots of knowledge. They want to keep that knowledge for themselves. They just don't want anyone else to have it. Ron DeSantis is making it almost impossible for kids to learn in school, and he's taking it a step further by making sure they can't even learn on their own time in libraries. Let dorks be dorks. Kids in Florida need an easy way to access information because everyone needs to know how to protect themselves against alligators and Matt Gates Banning a book can teach kids that what you will learn from them is dangerous or wrong or gross, that you're different, but in a bad way. When really, these books show us that we're not alone. We're greasy, and we're pimply, and we're scared of everything, and that's normal. Books give us the confidence that despite our greasy pimpliness, we could still maybe even explore our own bodies. I don't know. Is that nuts? Of course, it's not just Judy Bloom books, though. Honestly, I could support a library that was only Judy Bloom books. I'm just not sure that she would support that. <laughs> anyway, of course, it's not just Judy Bloom books. It's any book that challenges white heterosexual norms. They're cock blocking kids from getting any information about sexual orientation, gender, consent, race, like. I don't know what school is like in places like Arkansas or Oklahoma or any of the other states that I'm not allowed in, but I know that denying kids information comes from a place of deep fear and insecurity, and I hope when you're carrying the big pile of books to your book burning, it falls on you and crushes you to death. Maybe not to death. It just imperils you, okay? This is Choice Words. I'm Samantha B. Today we are joined by the author, Judy Bloom. You love her books like Super Fudge, Are You There God, It's Me, Margaret, Forever, Dini, and countless others. She's also the owner of Books and Books, a bookstore in, irony of ironies, Florida. Read her work while you still can. Enjoy the episode and make good choices. How are you? I'm kind of okay. I'm kind of good. <laughs> You're kind of good. I'm well, kind okay. Of good. What's what's happening? Why only kind of good? Are you discombobulated? Yes, I am that, and I'm packing to leave town tomorrow. Oh, you are. Yeah. Uh oh, what yeah. kind of a packer are you? I'm so curious. Do you, you pack? Do, do are you an intricate packer? Are you an organized packer? I am pretty organized. I mm -hmm. like packing to go home better than packing to go places because I don't have to make the decisions. You know, it's oh, whatever is yes. here. Although mm -hmm. I'm here in my apartment in New York, so it's not exactly like that. But do you know what? We're going to be very, we're, we're not going to spin out. We're going to make this a very chill experience for you. I can tell. I can tell that. Oh, the dulcet tones of my voice. We're here to have an easy, we're going to have an easy moment. There's it no is. pressure. Your voice mm -hmm. is so calming, <laughs> Sam. It is so well, good. For listeners who are listening to this podcast who aren't that familiar, we did an event together 
in, I think it was in 2015 for your book, In yes. the Unlikely Event, which was a huge book. Oh, we had a great time at the Y. We did. We had a we great did. time. We did. If, for people who don't know, there's a great documentary about you. And I don't say that it's great because I happen to be in it, which I am, <laughs> which was such a pleasure to do. But it's a great documentary. And I learned much about you that I actually didn't know. Plus, we have the movie, Are You There? God, It's Me, Margaret. How? What was that experience like making that film? Were you present for the filming of Are You There, God? I was on set for five weeks and okay. we divided it up because Kelly was shooting all the children okay. at once. And so I was there for two weeks and that was children. Mm -hmm. And then of course, Margaret and, you know, Nancy are there Yes, all the time. And so when I went back for three weeks, that was when um, the adults were there, Kathy Bates and Rachel McAdams and Benny Softy. Mm -hmm. It was the most wonderful experience I've ever had, wow. you know, doing anything like this. I, I mean, Kelly and Jim, everyone made me feel welcome, which is so new to me. Right. It's like, <laughs> what? The writer is welcome on set? That never happens. Yeah, exactly. That is exactly. a dream team. That's a dream team. They are. A, they are and were a dream team. And it's very faithful. It's a very faithful adaptation of the book. It's. I say if you like the book, you mm. will not be disappointed. Yes. But, but it's also a little bit expanded and so that you get to know the adult characters, mm -hmm. you get to know her family. And mm -hmm. I love it. I can't even remember anymore. And Kelly says the same thing. Neither one of us can remember, wait, did that come from the book or was oh, that something right. Kelly wrote for the movie? Oh, that's it's so like, funny. It's all together because it just works that way. Did did they consult you when you were there? Were you a part of conversations? Or I think there was a discussion about the box of maxi pads. Oh, yes, they they had forgotten. Somebody had forgotten that um, the kids buy something called teenage softies, which mm -hmm. of course doesn't exist. It's something I made up. And I was there when they were shooting the scene, and I'm going. You know, they're picking up a a traditional box okay. with a with a commercial name. Right. And I said, Kelly, you will hear from <laughs> um, the Margaret Brigade. Yes. You will hear from them and they will say, where are the teenage softies? teenage softies? And so finally, when I saw it with teenage softies, it was such oh, a relief. Yes, what yes. a relief because they would have heard from people. Do you have a brigade? Do you have Margaret Brigades? Yes. I once I once wrote a blog about the Margaret traditionalists mm -hmm. who want the belt and the pads oh, and versus okay. the ones who have allowed the fact that the like the second that book was published mm -hmm. everything changed and you could get pads with little sticky you know right, I think right, what right. kids still use today sticky right. pads that fit sticky in your pads. undies right and so it was a British um, editor who said to me you know mm -hmm. why don't we just put that in. And I did it. I did it myself. Mm -hmm. And, but still the people who read that first, you know, oh. the first edition, first they, edition, they want things as they were. They mm -hmm. wanted the belt. I'm sorry. Do you hear that siren? I or don't. No? Okay. No, I don't really. Oh, good. I'm so, well, you know what? I also live in New York, so I don't hear sirens. Maybe oh. the whole audience is like, is there a crime in progress? But <laughs> you and I are like, what? We don't even. Maybe. Mm, it's possible. I'm probable. It's probable. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I don't even remember the belts. I never saw, I, I skipped when I started my period. There were no belts. But you're young. There were no, no belts. belts. I mean, that, so the book came out in 1970. Mm-hmm. Okay. I can't remember what month, but it was right after that okay. that the equipment changed, <laughs> very soon after that. But, you know, there are still people out there who mm -hmm. have that first edition, and they're reading it now, and so they want to know. They like it. What are these belts? How do they work? And what are these belts? I cannot imagine trying to—you know what? I'm going to go home 
and I'm going to try to explain to my daughters that they, you used to have to wear a belt. <laughs> That's one thing yes. they will not be able to wrap their and brains. And then you had to choose between a safety pin mm -hmm. or um, a little hook oh. that was there. I used the safety pin. I don't okay. know why I thought that was easier than a hook. I guess it, it prepared me for diapers not too many <laughs> years after that. You know what? Those two things are not so far apart. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> they are not so far apart. Is it is it strange for you when people, because I imagine when you do, you do so much press, you go around, you do all these things. Is it weird for you that people introduce you as like a legend? Like, is it weird to hear that word? The icon. The icon. It is, it is. Legend. Yes. Yes. It's so weird. It's like, who are they talking about? So weird. So when you go back to your, nor your, your regular, the regularity of your life, when you return to Key West and you go back to the bookstore, what do those days look like? It seems very, it seems tranquil to me. But it's not. And it's no. worse now because it's become a destination. Oh. I mean, we love it in terms yeah. of, you know, people coming to the bookstore, but it's become right. a destination to go to Key West and go to the bookstore. And I left Cardboard Judy there while I was here. But, oh, yeah. you know, we have, <laughs> yes, we have a full-size Cardboard Judy. <laughs> People she, just stand next to it and take a picture? No, nah, they don't. I, I Actually, we thought they might, mm. which would save me a lot of trouble because it it's, you know, I like to work in the bookstore. Yes. I go there to work and I like to dust the shelves and arrange mm -hmm. the books and, mm -hmm. you know, scan them and and do my work as a, right. as a bookseller. And right. I don't get anything done. Right. Yes. And if someone's there, I'm sure you want to honor their experience of yes. seeing you. Yes. One thing that I noted when we were doing the event at the at the Y, it was so observable watching you interact with your fans. And you have interacted so deeply with your fans throughout the years. But when people meet you, they often have a really emotional experience. It's very meaningful for them. And the way that I observed you, just very carefully letting everyone have a real moment with you, <laughs> with a lineup out the door and down the stairs, it was remarkable. Just a lot of grace in those moments. It's, it's been very emotional over the years. Yes. yes. So this podcast is about choices that we've made, like big choices, little choices, things that seem like smallies, but actually turn out to be biggies as they echo through our lives. If you look back, is there a choice that you've made, either big or small in your life that affected absolutely everything? Like, is there an obvious one that comes to mind or is it not something you often think about? I, th I think I take myself back to um, that young woman that I was. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I was maybe 22. It was my first presidential election. Oh. It was actually probably the first time I voted. You had to be 21 to vote in New Jersey oh. then. So my first presidential election was John Kennedy was running okay. against Nixon. I was newly married, but I was pregnant. So I, I must have been married for a year or two. Mm -hmm. And I was pregnant with my first baby. Mm -hmm. And it was... November of 1960. And my husband was a young Republican. Okay. And he, you know, it was not such a, anyway, right. <laughs> I don't even go into the politics of 1960. Mm -hmm. I um, was a fan of John Kennedy's. And my husband was a young Republican who wanted me and expected me. I was a little <sighs> wifey and expected me yes. to make phone calls and um, deliver information and packets around mm -hmm. town. We lived in a little suburban town in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And I was expected not to think about these things for myself or argue mm -hmm. or tell him why 
I was for Kennedy. Mm -hmm. But I went into that voting booth and I remember still the way I felt when I pushed that lever for Kennedy. And it was like, I did this thing. I thought this out for myself. Uh I didn't do what I was supposed to do. I (gasps) kept it a secret for a long time. I kept it a secret. Wow. But I did it. And I mean, that was such a defiant and defining and defining moment in my life when it was like, I am not a person who's going to do what I'm told to do. Right. Right. And I actually, as I grew older and now am mature, so I'm supposed to be anyway, I don't like it when somebody tells me what to do. Even if it's take a breath, Judy, take a breath. Don't tell me what to do. (laughs) (laughs) Because that's who I am. But it was that moment that spoke to me. And and it felt so good. I don't think it spoke well for the marriage, the brand new marriage. <laughs> but <laughs> probably not. There were probably other indications along the way. Oh yeah. But sixteen years. I stayed married for sixteen years. You were married Through for sixteen two, years. Two children. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you know what? What I did that I'm proud of. I once I had the kids. I always, always took them to vote with me. Even if we had to sit there for hours, they knew this was exciting. And, you know, they would Mm -hmm. sit on the floor and play and then we'd move up in line a little. And they knew this was something important. I agree with that. My daughter's voting for her first time next year. She turns 18 next year. I'm so excited for her. So I just still, there's still possibility in a vote. I don't know. There's something about it. There's possibility in it. That's what we have to see. Yes. How much did he know that you were writing or did you start after that moment? Or you must have walked around with just that, you know, when you have that little like champagne tummy, just like little bubbles in your tummy, a little frisson in your tummy and you just like a little spring in your stuff Uh because you're like, I'm a rebel. I did something for me. Did he know that you wanted to be a writer at that point? Oh, no, I didn't know. I didn't know. You didn't know. No, she no. didn't. Know. I had I had the two babies, you know, one right after another. Well, two mm-hmm. years apart. Okay. And um I like that. I like babies. I like baby care. I liked having them around and taking care of them. And but then, you know, my mother told me, my mother said, when they take their naps, what you do is you wash the shoelaces from their little shoes so they're white and clean. Oh. Wash the shoelaces. What? Yes. And do you know, I did that. Oh. This is before they had little Velcro shoes. You know, they had little white shoes or saddle shoes with shoelaces. And I did that for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then I thought to myself, What am I doing? Right. Washing shoelaces when they're taking their naps. What? Why would anybody do that? Right. And so I had to rebel a little bit. You were like, I I didn't vote for Nixon. And I don't think that these shoelaces require this much cleaning. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. I, I, I think about my mother and... What she thought was important, you know? Yes. But anyway, I think um, that set me on my way to mm-hmm. know that I had to have something, something of my own to do that wasn't washing shoelaces. Want to listen to the rest of this episode? Head over to your favorite podcast player to hear the entire show. I highly recommend it. 